Hey, what's up everyone? Hui Yuan Pan coming to you from Cupertino, California. Today is March 24th, 2020. Welcome to week two of our live streaming lessons. And this week we're going to be doing a whole session on timing. Uh, timing is also the second volume from my Marching Percussion Playbook, uh, which is here. If you haven't heard of it before, Marching Percussion Playbook. Timing is everything is volume two. I'm happy to announce that I'm making this volume a free download this week. So the entire volume is available right now. Let me see if I can just pull these up here in these chats. Um, my social media handle is at Hoyuan Pan on all social media handles, channels. If you want to find me and, and reach out and say what's up, uh, so we, some of these shortcut keys. Let us know where you're watching from Instagram if you're coming in. Just say what's up. Hey Tyler, welcome to the room. Good to see, see ya. Strom, a little tongue tied today. Strom, what's up? Dylan, welcome guys. How you doing? How you doing? Thanks for coming to the room. Isaac, welcome to the room. Good to see ya. Uh, George, all right, we got a nice little crowd coming in. And um, let us know where you're watching from. Uh, even if this is the replay, you can let us know where you're watching from. And then uh, there's a little button on the bottom of Facebook, on YouTube, it's the, the subscribe and the notifications bell. But on Facebook, you can't hit all live notifications. Um, I'm trying to set a regular time for these weekly streams. On Sundays, it's pretty predictable and we have a little bit more um, manpower to wrangle the, the kids and things and we don't have Zoom school that the kids are doing, and there's just so much happening on the weekdays, and these start times are a little bit um, uh, fluid, depending on how things go in the afternoon. So anyway, if you're catching this after the replay, all your comments will show up as well, so um, let us know where you're watching from, and any questions that you might have as we're going through. Okay, so this is the handout. Let me pull this up over here for, this is trippy, I'm like seeing myself over here, I need to turn this off. It's like. So distracting. Well, I might want to talk to YouTube here in a second. So, well, you, YouTube, you guys can hear me, right? Um, this handout is here. So let me just pull this up here for us. Uh, this timing is everything handout, which you'll see over here. Uh, you can find at huayuanpan.com slash free lessons. And that link is down here as well, so you can see that. And I think that's it in terms of announcements. Uh, let me just say hi to some folks as we're coming in, and we will get started here. Let me pull up these comments. I'm, I'm getting better at these, this interface. It's still not ninja ready. Uh, Isaac said I had a drum lesson today over FaceTime. Awesome. San Antonio, Texas. Zaps account. Thank you for coming in. Uh, Manitowoc, Wisconsin. Awesome. Okay, all right, here we go. We're coming in. What's up, Instagram? Welcome, welcome, welcome. Hey, yeah, we got a nice little crowd coming in. Strom says, hey man, hope you're having a good day. My name's Sam. That's just my new username, Strom. Got it, Sam Strom. Thanks for letting me know. Guys, if you wanna let me know, you know, call me some, call you something different. I actually get pretty good at recognizing these names as they're coming in. What's up, Joseph? How's it going? Where can you download the free stuff? Hoyuanpan.com slash free lessons. Saludos, hasta Panama. Hey, como estas? Gracias, buenas tardes. Um, okay, Aroba. What's up, man? Welcome to the room. Okay, let's get started, guys. This is gonna be, oh man, my nose is getting a little itchy. Today is gonna be a like such a critical lesson. This is volume two. Volume one, when I was writing the book, just to give you a little bit of context. 421, I decided to start with 421. I'm gonna sneeze here in just a second. Fight it, or should I just let it happen? You know, like when you wanna sneeze and then you can't sneeze. <laughs> Okay, so when I decided which volume of the book to start with, uh, I decided with 421 because 421 is applicable to anybody at any stage to any exercise that you already know. So it's, you know, you can kind of serve a ton of people at once and it's ap applicable immediately for all those people, right? The same thing happens for timing and, and this is for all the percussionists out there. If you're a drum set player, if you're a classical player, if you're a pop music player, all percussionists, you know, or musicians really, this is gonna be the chapter where I talk about timing, which is also a, a universal topic that will cover uh, beginners through advanced players and something that is like a lifelong process that you're working through, okay? So in this chapter, we're gonna be working through like the first couple pages, and I just wanna share with you kind of my thoughts on timing and how it works, okay? So um, the reading stuff, I'll let you guys read on your own but I'll just read this little quote here in the beginning. It says, your ability to control and manipulate the pulse is one of the essential core skills of being a musician. 
you've got to figure out how to control your own pulse. You know, like when you're watching people play and they have a great sense of time and feel, um, and not only is the pulse steady, I used to think like level one was like, oh, you can keep a steady pulse because we spend so much time practicing with metronomes. But then you see like really great players and they are just masters of their time. They can stretch phrases at the end and they can pick things up when they need to and, and build momentum in the piece or some forward moving direction. But your, your ability to have great time is also really important for playing with other musicians. And so basically there's no way to get around this. You have to have a great sense of time if you're gonna be a musician of any sort, whether you're playing by yourself or with other people. Uh, super smart when you start tracking yourself, if you're recording any sort of music with click tracks or other musicians, if you can't play steady time, it becomes really obvious really fast. Okay, so read the little bit of introduction. And what I'm gonna do now is I'm going to, I'm, I'm getting a little bit better every day with these uh, technology chops. And I'm going to, um, let me swipe through the book here. This is the free download that you're looking at. Uh, you can get it right now. And I should mention real quick, if you do decide to get the free download, do me a favor and, and rate the, the product. As you're downloading it, um, the, the online store that I use, which is Gumroad, has recently introduced this product rating feature. So if you, if you enjoy this product or you think it's beneficial, please hit it with a five-star rating and so others can see that, like, okay, other people are actually picking up this product. This product has been listed for two or three years now, but they just introduced the rating system, which is why... There are no ratings. If you happen to pick up the first volume, uh, do me a favor and also go back in your email, click that link that, that was sent to you where you could download it and then you go and rate that first volume as well. Five star rating if you wouldn't mind, please. Okay, all right, so going into here and I'm trying to make it so Instagram can see this kind of, but not really, right? But basically uh, think of time, and this first section is called time concept. Think about your time or each beep of the metronome as like a like a circle, like a ball, right? So as it's clicking, you're getting these like boop, 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 boop. Each one of those beeps is a circle, okay? And if you play right in the center of the circle, which is here, can you see these clicks on the screen? Yeah. If you play right in the center of the click, that's on the beat, right? And you're, that's what we would refer to as bearing the metronome. But you can also play on the front of the beat, which is here, ahead of the beat or behind the beat. Okay, so I know this is kind of esoteric and you're like, oh, what is Hoi talking about? Let me just show you what I mean, okay? So this is the beep and each one of these is a circle. And let me turn the volume off for one second because every time I get a comment, it gets that little bloop. Andres Aya says, Facebook. Welcome, Dre. Sounds coming through. Usually Dre's my uh, my sound police and can catch me if I'm the, <laughs> if the sound's not on. Not that that's ever happened to me in a live stream. But, um, okay, so imagine that, yeah, you guys can see this over here. Oh, and guys, thank you. Those, those of you who are tapping those hearts, thank you so much. You can see that little flurry of hearts coming through. Really appreciate the love that you guys are sending this way. Okay, so each one of these beeps is a little ball that's going across the screen, okay? And if you play, I'm trying to hit the middle of that ball like it's one of those you know, carnival games, right in the square in the center of the ball, right? Thank you, guys, wow. Thank you for that love. I can see that coming through, right? Okay, that's not bad. Let me try one more time so I, <laughs> and listen to the metronome of the playing. So I'm trying to hit right in the center of that ball. You can also play a little bit on top of the beat. So you're still on the ball, but you're just the very front of the ball. It's a very slight difference. One more time, right in the center. I'm gonna move a little bit on top of the ball, in front, ahead. Okay, go back to center. And I can play a little bit behind. It's very, it's a, some people watch this are like, what, what is he doing right now? Like you can't hear the difference, but it's one of those things where you listen really, really carefully. And because that beep, that sound, there's actually, you know, the waveform is a certain length, right? So you could play here, you could play here, you could play there. There's all these different places that you can play. And, and to a musician, 
that space or that variance between where you're placing it on the beat is huge, right? And that's where we come, uh, we start to have style and feel. It comes from these different placements of the beat, okay? So now you're saying like, okay, I, I, I'm kind of understanding what you're saying. How do I practice this, okay? So this is really, this is a little bit easier to feel and understand if we apply it, apply it to an exercise. So let's try it with 8816, for example, okay? And first, I'm gonna try to bury the metronome and play right on the beat. And let me switch views here. Uh, the exercise we're going to play, uh, hold up, hold up, I can do this, I can do this, I can do this, I can do this, all right, I'm doing it guys, we're doing it, okay, and what I'd like you to look at is, oh, we're not going to look at the music yet, <laughs> I got ahead of myself, I hyped it up for nothing. Okay, let's, uh, I'm just going to play 8, 8, 16. Everyone knows this, 8, 8, and 16, 8, 8, 16, okay? I'm going to try to bury the metronome. Thanks for those hearts, guys. I can see, still see those coming through. Okay, here we go, 8, 8, 16. I'm trying to bury the metronome. This is 100 beats per minute on the mat. Okay, so for the most part, I would give that like a 95%. I'm burying the metronome right on the beat, right? Okay, now I'm gonna do the same thing, but I'm gonna try to move ahead of the beat. And you'll hear how, like, it's just not lining up exactly with the metronome. I'm with the metronome, I'm just ahead of the metronome a little bit. Okay, so you can hear that I finished a little bit on top of the beat, and then now I'm going to play a little bit behind the beat. Okay, so I'm laying on the back side of the beat now. Okay, and you can, that should make you kind of uncomfortable at first, right? We're like, ah, I just want to get back on the beat. And I have to tell everyone that, you know, there are different phases of my, of my life as a musician. When I was growing up, I hated practicing with the metronome because it was usually set at some torturously slow tempo. Um, but thankfully, my teach, teacher did that because it made me build correct habits, right? Um, and then playing in time just kind of became the default setting. Now when I became a percussionist, I became hyper aware of the metronome and it was like, I, even to the point where I had a who said, if it's not in time, then it doesn't count, right? So it was like, you had to play exactly metronomically perfect. And to me, it was black and white. You were either right or wrong, on or off the beat, right? And then when I started getting more mature as a player and started exploring different styles, um, I had a teacher who talked about real time as opposed to metronomic. He was like, yeah, you can play with the metronome if you want, but when you play with musicians, uh, you know, the time will ebb and flow. You'll, you'll speed up and you'll slow down, but you do it with other musicians. And I was like, oh, there's like so much more to this time concept thing. And I should credit this time concept idea I picked up in a master class uh, from Roger Ingram, who if you um, know brass players, if you're a trumpet player, um, Maybe most notably, one of the things that, he, that I knew Roger from was Roger played lead trumpet for Harry Connick Jr.'s big band. And yeah, I grew up listening to Harry Connick Jr. Um, and all his CDs when I was in high school. And then randomly when I was living in Chicago in LaGrange, like Roger moved to LaGrange and somehow I like met Roger I was, and he came and did a master class. I was like, whoa. And so I picked this up at a master class of Roger's and um, and so it's kind of really stuck with me and I've adapted it a few different levels since picking it up from him. But uh, if that is too esoteric still for you to grasp, like you're just like, okay, I'm on, I'm ahead, I'm, I, don't, I don't know if I am or not. This is the way that I introduce this to my students to practice it, okay? So what we're gonna do is we're gonna start on the beat and then we're just gonna play continuous eights and then we're gonna gradually speed up until we're outside or on top of the beat, okay? And then we're gonna, back it back down so that we're on the beat, and then we're gonna back it down a little bit even further, so now we're behind the beat, 
and then we're gonna back it back up until we're on the beat, okay? I do this a lot with my, my brass and woodwind students also with intonation, you know, you talk about playing in tune and then you play a little bit sharp and then you play in tune and then you play a little flat and then you play in tune, right? It's the same thing, we're, we're figuring out where this is and so in order to figure out where you're on the metronome, you've gotta be able to play on top, on, behind, and on top, okay? So I'll call it out for us as we're doing. Try this with me if you can, grab a pair of sticks and a pad and experiment with where you're placing the notes on the beat. And again, guys, thank you again for those charts. I can see all those coming through. So Facebook, draw my blueprint. Thank you guys. Okay, here we go. On the beat, please. So I'm doing my best to bury the metronome right in the center of every circle. Okay? You can hear what that sounds like. Okay, now we're gonna gradually speed up just a little bit, but you can't keep speeding up. You're just applying a little bit of gas. You notice that I'm landing just a little bit before the metronome now. I'm not exactly with the met anymore, but I'm consistent. Okay, that's too far, so let's pull it back a little bit. Okay, back and back down, slowly, back onto the beat. And we're gonna ease off the gas, so that we're behind. And turn cruise control back on. Speed back up just a little bit more gas so you're back on. And stop. Okay? So you can hear some of the, the analogies that I'm calling out. You can think of it like driving a car. This doesn't always work when I'm working with middle school and high school students because some of them haven't gotten their driver's license yet. But you know that when you're driving, if the speed limit is say 50 miles an hour, if you apply a little bit of gas, then you can go up to say 53 miles per hour, right? but you've gotten ahead now, and then you back it back down to 50, which is the speed limit, because you don't want to be speeding, right? So now you're at 50, but you're just a little bit further ahead than you were than before you added the gas, right? And there's another car next to you, right? And then you hit the brake, you slow down so you're back with the car, then you can slow down a little bit, and now you're behind the car, this is still the beat, uh, and now you resume 50 miles per hour, and so you're still here, now you're a little bit behind the car, and you guys are still moving in time, right? And so the idea is you want to be able to play ahead, on, or behind, and move freely between them, not because you can't tell or you can't control it, but because you're consciously making a decision to move between uh, the placement of your time concept. Is this too far out there? Let me know in the comments if this makes sense or if, if way you guys are like, I don't know what you're talking about right now, which is totally fine. This is uh, examples that I've shown uh, here. Let me pull this up in... But a but a boom. Okay, so this is an example if you're behind the beat. This is if you're ahead of the beat, right? I come here. Uh, I talk about pulse dissonance in this chapter, which I'll talk about in a second. Let me just see if there are any questions real fast. Christian, welcome to the stream. Thank you, my friend. Coming through. What's a double route map? Double route map. I don't know what that means, Thomas. That might be like a piece of hybrid vocabulary, I don't know, what's a double route map, I don't know. Tyler says, this is awesome. Okay, great, thanks Tyler, thanks for letting me know. Okay, this makes sense. Kind of a quiet room today, no worries. Uh, let me know if this is making sense. Hello, Big Sherm Pro. Okay, all right, well I'm just gonna, I'm gonna take the silence as making sense, but feel free to ask questions, because if you have a question, there's a good chance that someone else in the room has a question, and they just, aren't getting a chance to ask it, especially for our replay viewers because they're not able to attend right now. Uh, if you're a teacher and you have other ways of explaining it, other analogies, other teaching tools that you'd like to share, please share those in the comments as well because then we can all benefit and learn from this together. Okay. Hi, Ed. Welcome to the room. Uh, says, this is something most teachers don't cover. Yeah, it's kind of an advanced topic idea. It's, it's a little heady, right? And then you fall into that trap as a teacher that you're talking too much, kind of like I am right now. But I've found uh, that if I introduce this idea to my beginners early on, you know, they are even aware of like, hey, we're supposed to be playing in time. Not only are we playing in time, but we're playing a little bit ahead, we're playing a little bit behind. And then now when I talk to them about style and feel, it's like, look, this part needs to be a little bit more on top of the beat. Let's drive this section a little bit more. You know, as a teacher, a lot of times you think you, your students know what you're talking about, um, but if they don't have the fundamental vocabulary or understanding of how to place the beat, sometimes that's just like, whew, 
right over their head. Okay, all right. So read the section about pulse dissonance. It's basically like if you're tearing, I, I talked about this in a stream the other day. It's like if you're in time and all of a sudden you just like slam on the brakes and all of a sudden you tear from the, the metronome, then you can have that dissonance. Um, and that's actually tearing, dissonance is the, the space before you tear, right? So if I'm playing like this, I'm going, I've torn from the metronome. I'm, I'm not pushing or pulling anymore. I'm just not with the metronome, okay? Dissonance is where you can be off from the time. Like in a drumline setting, maybe typically you're more on top of the beat. You're, you're driving the time and it's a little bit dissonant in the sense that you're not with the met, but you're playing on top of the beat, right? Um, in a jazz setting, you might have feels where like the drum set player and the bass player are both laying back. Go bing, ding, 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 ga ding, 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 ga ding, ga ding. You're laying back on the beat together. Or you could have dissonance where the drum set player is driving and playing a little bit more on top of the beat and the bass player is playing a little bit on the back side of the beat and then creating that rhythmic or timing tension so that when they do come back together, it's like, ah, bang, and you get to the, the shout section or the chorus. Um, so lots of different ways that you could be using this for various styles and phrases. Okay, so burying the metronome, that basically means you're playing right on top of the beat. Before we do this next little bit of today's lesson, let's apply this same concept of being ahead, on, and behind to another exercise. Okay, so let me come down here. I'm already in this view. Let's go back down to this exercise view. I'm trying to figure out the best way to be able to show people um, what is going on as we're playing. You know, there's just there's a couple different ways you can do it, and I'm, I've almost figured out the way that works best for me. What? Okay, almost. Come on, you can do it. You can do it, way. You can do it. You can do it. All right. So let's try. This exercise. Okay, so we're looking at exercise number one, and we're just looking at this line. Um, this exercise, real quick, I, I add a downbeat on bars two and four. So this pattern one E and a two E and a three E. Uh, a lot of times you'll see this exercise without that downbeat on beat three, but I add it especially for my middle school and high school players. Sometimes it's easier for them to make sure that they feel where beat three is. So it's just not this, you know, again, esoteric E a uh, E a uh, thing, right? They know that it's three E a uh, E up uh, one E a uh, E a. Uh. Um, and so the first pattern is this one E and a two E and a, if you haven't seen this time, this is a basic time exercise, two beats of check, one E and a two E and a, three and four and, and then the second pattern is one E and a two E and a, two counts of check again, three E a uh, E a uh, one. Okay, so if you put those together, you have one, two, three, four, one, two, three E a uh, E a uh, one. Okay, so if that blew you out of the water, then just go back and rewatch this section. Um, but it's basically those two patterns and then we just repeat it, okay? So we're gonna play this exercise on loop, but we're gonna practice putting it on the beat, ahead of the beat, on the beat, behind the beat, and then back on the beat, okay? And we'll do two reps of each before we shift to each one of those. And this is one of those things where the more you do it, the better you'll get at it. And you'll be able to you know, get a feeling for how far can I push before I tear? And like you're trying to push out, but then you're like way too far out. And so you just become a little bit more in control of how much you can move the time. Um, Nina, welcome to the room, Nina. Good to see you. I owe you an email. I'm so sorry, like, thank you so much for sending that email, but I, I'm gonna write you back. Um, thanks for coming to the room. Hope you're doing great. Uh, Kai, Kai Lua High Percussion. It does make sense, great. Thank you for letting me know. Thanks for the feedback, gang. Let me pull this down. I'm gonna come up here and just check these. Christian's coming in. So it is from Argentina. Awesome, okay, let's try it. Okay, so two times through on, and I'll call it out as we go, okay? Uh, I'm gonna turn on the eighth note just so you can hear a little bit better. Uh, if you're with, I should I'm first go around as I bury the metronome. I'm trying to cover every one of those notes up with my own playing, okay, here we go. And one, two, here we go. Now a little head. Back 
Back on. Little off, behind. Back on. Okay, now I wouldn't do it like this if I was practicing. I would do more of whatever it is that I was trying to do. Um, and this is just for time's sake that I'm kind of like cycling through each one, one rep time through. So just get a feel for it, right? But again, you can do this with any exercise that you have. Just practice playing on the beat, playing ahead of the beat, and playing behind the beat. And it's, it's actually not a bad idea to do that little circuit run by yourself, right? Or you could have a buddy call it out for you and, and it's almost like a pop quiz, right? Like play ahead of the beat. And then the next rep you have to do it, do it ahead. There are actually some uh, motor skill and perceptual studies that show that if you do this circuit training type where it's just kind of like you're mixing it up, it's called like contextual interference. Um, you might be doing worse as you're doing this, um, citation hall et al. Um, but if you're doing this as you're practicing, your performance might actually be worse in practice, but then when it comes time to actually perform, your rate of retention and transfer is actually better because you're doing this mixed contextual interference type practice. Okay. Um, should we try that one more time and then move on to the next exercise? And Dustin says, thanks for all the videos. Love hearing your expertise. Thank you. My pleasure. Thanks for that nice comment. Okay, let's do that one more time. Let's do a few more reps of each before we try to go ahead or on. And then I also notice it's easier to accelerate or decelerate uh, on those last, as you're moving into that next section. So make it a little bit more natural as opposed to like all of a sudden being on or all of a sudden being behind or all of a sudden being ahead. Okay, here we go. Uh, let's start with on the beat again, find our center. One, two. Again, right on the beat. Okay, speeding up a little bit, ahead of the beat. You can hear him just a little ahead. Slowing back down, on. Slowing down. Behind. Speeding back up. Okay, so why is this important? You will gain more control of your own sense of time. You're gonna be able to play ahead, back, and then something that you'll find later on is like when you're trying to play on, your awareness to it, and you're gonna, it's gonna make it easier for you to play, boom, square in the center of the beat. Like burying the metronome is my default mode, and then I might play a little bit more on top or behind depending on the style or the context. And then when it comes to playing with other musicians, if you feel them start to move, it's not gonna be this like, whoa, what are you doing? The, the tempo is 120, we're not moving, right? And that, that's not real life. When you get on the, on the field or you're in the concert or you're in the recital or you're performing, you get a little bit nervous, tempos start to rise, like the tempo is gonna move and you're gonna have this ability to just go with the flow because you've practiced this on your own at home. This is like a very clinical way of practicing what's gonna happen in real life so that Preparation meets opportunity. That doesn't really work in the sense. Basically, you're prepared for when the situation arises. Okay, any questions about this? I think that's a good stopping place for today's lesson. Just this time concept, it's a little bit out there. Tomorrow, we're gonna talk about um, when you bury the metronome, the way you could be hearing these, the syncopation that occurs between timing patterns. So. Last week, we did a lot of this with 421. If you caught those live stream lessons, thanks so much. 
And if you sent those follow-up messages or you download the handout, thanks for doing that. In the 421 chapter, we talked about these three-note timing patterns, right? And tomorrow we're gonna talk about what you should be hearing between what you're playing and the metronome, the idea of putting a composite rhythm together as you're working through these timing patterns. Of course, you have three notes, 16 note timing patterns, two note and one note. Um, lots of ways that you could and should be practicing this. Um, oh, my computer's freaking out. I even restarted it right before I started. There's probably gonna be a little bit of a lag, it looks like, coming through on Facebook and I, I don't know why it does, like something happens, like either I'm getting a call or something comes in that makes my computer freak out. And now it's like running crazy slow. Maybe that's my cue to wrap up today's lesson. Oh man, this is tough. Okay. All right. Um, any questions? Let me take a couple questions and see if there's anything going on. And um, and then we'll probably just wrap for today's lesson, guys. Okay. Uh, Tyler says, you're playing out of timing is everything. That's right. Every, everything I'm playing right now is coming out of timing is everything. Yep. M. Dawson says, is this time exercise something you would recommend practicing in a full drumline setting? Yes. Absolutely, Dawson. And this is what's going to happen is regardless of any drum line that you're in, everyone is gonna have a different background and timing. And uh, I used to joke with my friends and my students for sure, like when you're looking at players, you know like when you're playing a video game and different players have different power bars? <laughs> when you play with musicians, different musicians have different timing bars. Like their strength, you know, they're like 100th level warrior timing. And they can play on, they can play behind, they can play with the metronome, they can turn the click into the E or the and or the uh. I mean, they are masters of their own time. And then you have some people who are just like holding on for dear life, like just dear God, help me play the right sticking in the right rhythm, <laughs> right? And so as an instructor, this is one of those things where it's really easy to just glaze over time and you're like, okay, play in time. You're rushing, you're dragging. <laughs> You know, like you hear instructors shouting at their students about this, but a lot of times, again, students don't even know what you're talking about. Like, okay, rushing is bad, I know that, but how do I tell if I'm rushing? Am I rushing now? Am I dragging now? Who knows? So you have to teach them how to do this. And then part of getting a drum line to play together is you've got to give everyone the same foundation. Um, we played a bunch of timing exercises when I was in high school. I, would, I give my teachers credit for that, absolutely, and thank them so much for training us for doing that. I also remember my first summer of drum corps, Marching Phantom Regiment, there was this one day where we spent probably four hours in a percussion ensemble block with the front ensemble and the battery just tracked box drill, you know, front right, front left, back right, back left. And we just repped this timing sequence over and over four hours, literally. And we got water and when we do it again, we get water. And it was just like a, it was like a timing block. And, um, we started really, really slow. And I just remember being like, wow, this is, is like mind numbing and like you're having to concentrate and we really stair stepped it through all the tempos. And, um, but that was a turning point in the season for us because up to that point, we hadn't spent that much time kind of just getting everybody on the same page. So you're not rushing four and one at the end of a phrase or digga digga da, you're not slow and then speeding up. It's like. If everyone just agrees to play the right rhythm, it just makes everyone's life a lot easier. Okay, let's keep going. Uh, Marching Health says, thanks. You're welcome. I, maybe I missed a comment from earlier up top. Um, I just got here, man. What's up? Thanks for everything, Hui. You continue to be a great educator. My pleasure, Tyler. Thank you. Thank you for those nice comments. Really appreciate it. Thanks for showing up. What's up, Shane? How's it going? Hello, hello. Um, Sam says, how are you handling the virus? Uh, we are being informed and calm, I would say. I was watching this video from, uh, oh, I'm going to blank on his name, Matt Diavella. His last name is Diavella, maybe? And he made this great chart. It was basically like people who are uninformed and panicking uh, or people who are uninformed 
but calm, uh, and if you're informed and panicking, basically those three quadrants all get eaten by the zombies. And then there was a fourth quadrant he described as being uh, informed and calm, right? You need to know the severity of the situation, but also just stay calm and do what you can. You have to know what the risk is. I was listening to someone else really, which is like, you need to know what the risk is. Oh, um, astronaut, NASA astronaut has a master class. Name is escaping me at the moment. But basically it's like, you need to know the extent of the risk. And right now it is very serious. If you're, if you're watching the news and what some of the judgment calls that are being made, Right now they're saying, uh, some of the government officials are saying that they want to be up and running within two weeks by Easter. It's like, no, it's like you need to be smart about this because right now we are practicing social distancing, we're flattening the curve. And what that means for us is we're basically holed up in our house and unless we absolutely need to go outside to interact with other people. Of course, we're making a, I'm being very intentional about taking the kids out, running them around outside in the sun. That's a big part of our day, just to burn off some energy and still get some fresh air. Sun and fresh air is always good for you. And um, yeah, I, you know, I've, I've been working from home for the last two years almost now. So habit-wise, it's actually not very different for me. Um, part of these streams, the reason why I'm doing them, because I've gotten quite a few calls from friends and teachers and students this past week. I know that this is a very strange and unusual time that none of us have ever dealt with. And being at home and being alone is kind of strange. Uh, Drumline Chops executive team, we did a talk about this last week, last Thursday actually, which is in my Facebook uh, video stream. Uh, we talk about how we're handling uh, being at home and for all three of us, we've been working remotely for Eric six months, Carl almost three years now, for me two years. And so ways of communicating and connecting with others like on technology like we're doing right now, in the direct messages afterwards. It's very important for your, your mental health also. So I would say just be smart, uh, wash your hands frequently. That's the advice that you hear all the time. There's another YouTube, I have an idea for compiling a YouTube playlist of all the videos that I've been watching that I think are like, okay, this is really good information. This is what I'm sharing with my kids uh, about what's happening. And basically people are really bad at washing their hands sufficiently. Uh, germs spread very quickly and we have a tendency to touch our face all the time. So when I watch some of my restreams and I'm like editing them and I see myself scratch my face or touch my nose, I'm always like, ah, stop that, stop touching your face. I think the average is 16 times per hour people touch their face. So just do your best not to touch your face if you need to, you know, have a tissue and just wash your hands frequently, that's a big part of it. Um, yeah, so just be calm but informed. All right, let's keep going. Thanks for those hearts, guys. Any more drummy questions? More time to pad. That's right, Tyler. Hey, Dylan, welcome to the room. Good to see you. Welcome, welcome. Hi, Magali, good to see you. Here we go. How are we handling the virus? Okay, all right. I think that's all we have for questions today. Um, why don't we take a few minutes? I'll show you guys one more thing that I've been working on. Uh, this is something that, that showed up in the 421 lessons last week. I haven't found someone yet who can tell me this. Uh, I should probably post a video and I want to ask Kevin Donka because he knows like all the names for everything. But uh, it's basically same hand or Swiss flam drags. So the sticking is flam, right, left, right, right, left, or left, left, right, left, left, right. Okay, so that's what we were working, and in order to, the play, to play that, the skeleton first is just the same hand sticking, right? And then you add the drag. And then we would play a cheese, right? If we we're doing a spree of some sort, you'd play the drag on the downbeat, but because you're using the same hand drag sticking, it would be right, right, left. Right, 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 left. Right, instead of instead of alternating, we're going right. And this is that sticking you'll see at the top of Diddy. Right, so you've got that figured. Okay, and then where we would typically play a flam five. 
we're playing a drag on the downbeat and on that second partial. Now we're putting four notes in the right hand, again because of the sticking. That is the thing that I stumbled across as we were doing a 4-2-1 lesson. And one of the things I said in 4-2-1 was like, yeah, you get, there's endless combinations and variations that you can be doing. And I don't think I've ever played that piece of vocabulary. I don't know what that's called. It's kind of like the... If, if you know what that's called, right, right, left, 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 left. It's a sextuplet grouping, but it's a double and then fours. I think they're called car starters. Lawrence. Uh, when a student that I taught for a short time in Los Angeles, he mentioned it to me once in some like BD vocabulary, but you see it in, uh, I think I've seen Pulse play some of this vocabulary also, as well. I think those are called car starters. If you know what that's called or you can verify that for me, let me know. But this, where there's a flam and you're playing four notes. I haven't seen that before and I don't know the name of it. So I'm gonna coin this term and then you can cite Hue as, as the uh, origin source of this until we hear otherwise. And I'm gonna call those Scooby Dooby Doos. Scooby Dooby Doo. While I was practicing these, my daughter was watching something and she heard Scooby Dooby Doo for the first time and she thought it was hilarious. She's like, Scooby Dooby Doo? And I was like, wait, Scooby Dooby Doo, Scooby Dooby Doo. So I'm gonna call them Scooby Dooby Doos for now until I hear otherwise. Okay, here, I see a couple questions coming through and then I'm gonna take a, take a Q&A and then we'll get it. We'll do a lesson at some point at your approach and grip. Yeah, Tyler, I actually did one last Sunday. So not this previous Sunday, but the Sunday before that. It was match grip versus traditional grip. And the whole lesson is about, you know, the, the strengths and limitations of each one of these grips and, and my approach to them. I've also got a free left-hand traditional video course. If you go to drumlineblueprint.courses, drumlineblueprint.com slash courses, uh, there's a le free left-hand traditional preview where I go into left-hand traditional in depth. The first three videos are free. And um, check out that video. If you have a particular question about grip, uh, let me know and I'll be happy to answer that as well. Um, says, will you do a lesson on your approach to grip at point? My students are very much into your content. Yeah. Cool, awesome, thanks Tyler. Yeah, so check out that stream and then maybe you can share that stream with them. I'm, uh, those are on Facebook. I'm gonna get these videos up on YouTube at some point, somehow. I don't know yet how. Um, obviously these streams are going out to Facebook uh, live now as well. Although it's frozen on my screen at the moment now, so I don't know if this is still working or not over here, but on Instagram it is. Uh, but I'll get these videos um, out to YouTube as well. And of course, they're going to be edited down. You're going to see like the, the professional production level of them inside of our Drumline Blueprint complete course. So uh, if you haven't heard about that yet, that's our you know, A to Z Drumline course. Beginners, advanced players, teachers. It gives you like the, the blueprint of how to put together a Drumline the type of exercises that you might want to play. Um, and we added a monthly subscription plan because uh, for some folks, you know, instead of buying, you can buy it all at once if you want, but also sometimes it's a little bit more accessible if we have this, this monthly plan that we set up recently. So that's been going really well. We're welcoming a lot of new members into that course now, and it's exciting to continue to fill that course. And as we fill it with more content, you just have you know, lifetime access to all the content that was already in there, plus all this bonus content that we're continuing to, to fill into that course. So, okay. Um, all right, let me try one last thing, and then we're gonna we're gonna call it here. Um, although I don't know if I can because the screen has officially frozen over here on this other screen. Maybe try it in tomorrow's lesson. Uh, but what I was doing is I was pulling videos in. Yeah, my screen's frozen over here. So Facebook and and YouTube, if you guys are still here, thanks for watching. Or if this is all janky, I'll, I'll find out afterwards. Oh, there's a question still coming through. Michael Brown says, you're frozen. Oh, maybe there's still sound coming through when I'm frozen. Michael says, how do you approach breaking down ninelets? Paradiddle, diddle, sticking threes, timing specific. Ooh, great question, Michael. So I think because my stream is frozen over here, why don't we answer that question in tomorrow's um, live lesson? 
Join me again tomorrow at 6 p.m. Central. So that's four o'clock PST for me over here. And um, we'll answer that question for you, Michael, once the stream is up and running. And um, also tomorrow I wanna try something where I'm gonna take a video submission. You know, I get questions in the direct messages all the time. Uh, a student sent me a video and because they'll describe a scenario like, hey, how do I do this or how do I get better at this? I can give you kind of a generic answer, but if you show me a video, I can say, okay, here's what I see, here's what I hear. This is the exercise or how I'd, I would go approach, I would approach practicing it, right? So I'm gonna take a video that was sent to me and then I'm gonna, we're gonna watch it together and I'll show you what I hear and it'll be basically like a, a live breakdown lesson for a video. If you would like me to do one of your videos in a live stream like this where I, give you like specific feedback for your video. Um, just find me on Instagram, at Hoyu and Pan, send me a video of yourself playing an exercise. When you do it, just make sure the camera's not too close so that I can see your hands, your wrists. If you don't wanna show your face, that's totally fine too, but you know, if you're okay with showing your face, that also helps too, because you might be sitting there playing with your, your mouth open and I'll tell you to close your mouth as you're playing. But uh, just make sure that I can see your arms and your hands. A little further back is better than too close. And then have a metronome in the background also, not too loud, not right by the phone, but over closer to you so that we can hear where you are in relation to the, uh, the tempo, okay? If you're marking time, I can help you with that also so if you can get your feet in even better. But if you just wanna do at least a waist up shot, that'll be good, okay? Send it to me on Instagram. If you don't have Instagram, send it to me on your social media platform of choice. Or you can find me on my website, williampan.com and send me a YouTube link, okay? All right. Yeah, Michael says, yep, still getting audio. So, all right, thanks for the feedback, Michael. Sorry that the uh, the picture has frozen on, on your end. Maybe it'll render after the fact, but um, uh, we'll get these full videos because I'm also shooting like the nice version of the videos. We'll get these up on at YouTube at some point as well. And we'll answer your question tomorrow, Michael, about how do you approach breaking down nine-lets, paradiddle diddle, sticking, threes, et cetera, timing specific. Okay, all right, thanks everyone. Let me just pop in make sure I haven't missed anything. Yeah, Blueprint Stream froze. Thanks, Rick, for letting me know. Um, and then Tyler, check out that grip lesson. Let me know if you have any specific questions for that. And if nothing else, I'm gonna go ahead and wrap it up. Drum my Blueprint, you guys know the drill. Thank you so much for tapping out those, uh, those outgoing hearts. If you have any questions, uh, shoot me a direct message. And please do me a favor, share, share, share this stuff out. You know, a lot of us are, I usually have like an outro screen. Oh, like, Looks like these overlays are still showing up. You can download the free PDF from today's handout. The handout from, <laughs> I can't talk. You can download today's free PDF from my website, wayyoandpan.com slash free lessons. It's gonna be free for this week. Um, and where is this? Here, yep, there's that. Thanks so much for watching everyone. We'll see you in the next lesson. All right, bye.